Hey, everybody, I have a special treat for you today. We are going to interview George Norman Lippert, the author of this book, Ruins of Camelot, and also the James Potter series, which is a sequel to the Harry Potter series, five full length novels. The stories that I have read on my YouTube channel, Write Me Poetry, uh, Merlin's Gift, Harry's First Christmas, and coming soon, Petra's Getaway. Also, he has written several other books and has a website that is phenomenal. It's gnlippert.com. I hope you will check it out. And we are about to get started, so I hope you enjoy. I am joined today by George Norman Lippert, and he is the author of the James Potter series and several other stories that we are going to talk about today. Thank you for joining in. And George Norman Lippert, how are you today? I am fabulous and looking greatly forward to a productive, illuminating, and uh, entertaining conversation. I look forward to it as well. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. <laughs> okay, so I asked you this um, before, but we said we were going to okay. save it for the video. I have to ask, to which Hogwarts house do you identify? Which one do you think I would be? Ooh. That's a hard question. I can't, you don't have any idea which one I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, hmm. I considered Ravenclaw, but I also considered Slytherin just now, like when you asked me that. Because it's a Slytherin so my, question to ask, isn't it? <laughs> I think it is. I think it is. This is a completely wrong uh, Yes, I'm 100% Slytherin. Awesome. Yep. We have two kids. My wife is a Gryffindor, 100%. That's, that's, it was never any question. And she knew I was Slytherin uh, before we ever took the test. And we've taken the test multiple times just to be sure um, yeah. <laughs> that we have another. My daughter is also Slytherin, very proud Slytherin. And my son is a Ravenclaw. So we, we kind of cover the okay. gamut. No Hufflepuffs. We had a dog for a while. That we're pretty sure it was a Hufflepuff. But um... <laughs> what is the very first thing you'd want someone to know about you before any other conversation ensues? What should we understand first about George Norman Lippert? Ooh. I always feel like I shouldn't answer with what most people think is the most obvious answer to that question, which was, you know, I'm not going to say I write books. Uh, I'm an animator. I'm an, I'm a novelist, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, when I first meet people, I'm more interested in asking about them. And that's a relatively new thing to me. I think I've become a little more um, possibly a little more extroverted. Um, I've always been very introverted by nature, but now I don't, well, maybe actually it's an introvert thing. I don't want to talk about myself. Hmm. But if I was to answer the question, strictly speaking, I guess I would like to say to people, I'm a consummate creative. What I want them to know about me is I'm, I'm curious and I'm a creative. Um, so curious means I want to know about people. I want to know what they're interested in. Um, I'm also interested in different ideas. I want to know different ways of thinking. I want to hear, I want to hear from other people. Yeah, okay, that's number one. I'm curious. I want to know from other people why they think the way they do, what they do, um, what their philosophy of life is, and I want to absorb it. Even though I don't necessarily agree with it, I want to absorb it and be like, I understand you better now, and maybe it's changed a little bit of who I am too. So that would be my number one, above and beyond like I'm a creative and I write books. I'm curious. Yes. I want to know about you, and I want to know about your thoughts and ideas. So, yeah. I love that, and I need to do that more. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I spent I most of my life, I'm 51. And, um, my wife says, what's happened to you just in like the last six months, because I've become much more interested in other people. I think I was kind of a narcissist to be completely honest. I was very <laughs> self-centered and self-focused and maybe creatives have to be to some extent. Um, but yeah, I've, I've really changed now. And now I really want to hear from other people. I want to know what they're like and what's going on with them. I think that's great. And I, I definitely get the kind of self-focused thing sometimes because you you have a project you're working on or you have an idea that's trying to form and you want to capture it and other things and other people sometimes feel like a distraction and I think oh, that absolutely. we get to that point of yes that was a distraction but it might be a helpful distraction <laughs> well I and think so it is necessary you know we creatives I think by design spend a tremendous amount of time up on our heads. We have to. That's where the create creativity comes from. Um, but then I do think there comes a time when we need to turn that off and turn outside ourselves to open up ourselves up to other ideas, other people's experiences, interests in other people, because selfishly, 
that's where we get more ideas, more creativity. <laughs> it's very I do. true. So I can be unselfish and selfish at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're humans. <laughs> I think that's the best we can hope for. So the first time I read your name was on the cover image of James Potter and the Hall of Elders Crossing. After reading that book and its sequels, I was starstruck by this amazing author who embodied the spirit and image of the wizarding world in his stories. Uh, I've actually been very nervous about this interview for that reason. Uh, the oh, JP God. series <laughs> instantly became canon in my mind. So sue me. Can you tell me a little mm -hmm. about the adventure of writing this series? So, so um, I'm trying to decide if I should tell the short version or the long version. I want to tell the medium version. Um, okay. I started out as an illustrator. When I was a kid, all I did was draw. I drew pictures and uh, I also dabbled with writing stories. But what I discovered very quickly was um, if I walked up to my mom or dad or my friends at school and said, here, look at this drawing that I made. They'd say, great. Wow, that's fantastic. Looks good. Looks great. If I walked up to them and said, read this 10 page story I wrote, they're like, I'm kind of busy. I don't think so. No, thanks. I'll get to it. So I learned very quickly on to put all my energy into my my art and not my writing. Uh, wow. So writing was always just a fun hobby. But I think the process, so I I, I, I moved from um, illustration to drawing comics, you know, which was a little, because you could tell a little more of a story with a comic. Um, and then from comics, I learned animation and I learned you could tell more story through the visual or form of animation. And slowly, I began to realize that what I really want to do most of all is just tell stories. My art had always been pushing me to into the, the, the realm of telling stories. So obviously, the most the, the purest form of that is just writing down words and creating a narrative. So um, I started doing that a little more. My first book um, that I actually published was called Flyover Country. And it's this mm. goofy, whimsical, silly story about a farmer who learns how to fly. Like he learns how to fly by flapping his arms and <laughs> what becomes of him. And it's a very silly, but I think it's a very heartfelt story. And that was years before we even heard of Harry Potter. Uh, but, but still, even then, I didn't take my writing seriously. And then um, my wife and I got completely hooked by Harry Potter, kind of against our will. I mean, I'm like one of those <laughs> artists. Uh, I think a lot of us are individualists to the point where when we hear somebody saying, everybody loves this, we go, nah, I don't want to look at it then. And so I was like, right. yeah, I'm not going to read the Harry Potter stuff. Um, but a friend of ours got us the audiobooks, And yeah, so we ended up getting hooked by the audiobooks, Um, And then we just devoured them. I mean, this is back, you know, when they were first being written. So we had to wait a year or two years between books. Um, the seventh one comes out. We parse it out chapter a day. You know, we're still listening by audiobooks because that was tradition by then. And we finish it, and I was bereft, as so many other Harry Potter fans. We were satisfied and delighted the story was done, but that couldn't be it. There's so much more story to tell. <laughs> so it was the next day that I just started drabbling this, this little drabble about um, James Potter. I was more interested in James as the firstborn than I was Albus, even though Albus was the focus of the, uh, the uh, epilogue. Um, so I wrote this little thing, this little... Think about James getting on the train. He's the son of Harry Potter. He's confronting this shadow of his father. What's this going to be like for him? And he meets these two unusual characters. And that was all I wrote. And that was all I intended to write. And I read it to my wife that night. And she, who was my toughest critic, she said, this is good. And I was like, wow, really? And she said, yeah, you should write some more. And uh, uh, somehow, amazingly, that turned into a book. And uh, she said, you should put this up online. And, uh, and so I did. And it became a thing. Much more yes. so than I ever expected. History I written. The, yeah, I look. I upload. Well, actually, I launched the website, thinking, you know, announcing that. Like, I don't know if you. you so, so um, yeah. I guess a lot of readers don't know this. When I first built the website, um, you know, James Potter, you know, whatever. I can't remember what the web address was. Um, I built a really cool website. It was all in Flash because Flash was all the rage back then. Um, and I was a web designer, so I knew I made it look really good. And yeah, so this before I even and I announced that the, there was a countdown, the book will be released. Well, actually, the first chapter will be released at, on this particular date and sometime in December of that year. And it got a couple of hits and a couple of days went by. And I got a couple of hits. And I told myself if 100 people read this story and say that it's, it helped their Harry, their postpartum depression, I'll be happy. <laughs> well, weeks before the story went live, all of a sudden getting thousands of hits a day. 
And I realized this had be, become a news story. Some news, a news outlet in Australia had picked this up saying, this website, I'm going to say this as humbly as possible, this website can't be a fan website. This has to be the underground work of J.K. Rowling or Warner Brothers. And That's so fabulous. I was like, that was, <laughs> I was like, this is amazingly cool. And then I thought, I am in so much trouble. I thought I am going to be so screwed. No, no. So I got, somehow I got a hold of um, Little Brown and Company, which was J.K. JK Rowling's uh, publisher at the time. And uh, they ended up calling me back. I think I emailed them with my phone number and they called me back. And the first thing they said was, we wondered when we'd hear from you. <laughs> wow. It sounded ominous, but it ended up not being ominous. They ended up basically saying, um, I, I offered to send them a preview copy. They took it. That's not to say, I don't, I, I know J.K. Rowling. I, don't, I seriously don't think J.K. Rowling ever looked at it, but they, <laughs> they breezed over. They said, this is fine. We're, we don't have any problems with you. You're not going to sue you as some newspapers are saying. Um, just don't attribute to J.K. Rowling. Uh, make sure it's kid appropriate and, and don't make any money off of it. That was it. And that was what I about it. I wrote it for the love of the story and that was all. So that was uh, how it launched. And that's, that's um, I kind of what, before the story even came out, that's what made it kind of a bigger deal than I ever thought it was going to be. Wow. I'm sorry. I've got a little thing that just imagining going through that, um, seeing someone say, this can't be, this can't be fixed. You know, oh, I say fiction. Yes. Fiction. This can't be fiction. And this fiction. has to be nonfiction as all Harry Potter is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love that. And I honestly, when I read it, I mean, within the first few chapters of Hall of Elders Crossing, I was like, yeah, this is my canon. This is just, <laughs> this is actually what happened. Uh, I did want to thank you so much, you and Tom, for giving me the chance to read uh, Merlin's Gift and Harry's First Christmas on YouTube. It was a gift to us, too. <laughs> Loved it. That has been so much fun. Um, so it's fascinating to me to consider, you know, what the Hogwarts founders, how they might have celebrated Christmas. It's just nothing that ever came to my mind um and of course how the marauders you know how before i saw your title harry's first christmas i had not even considered that harry was actually with his parents on christmas his first christmas yeah. and then i thought back to the years i was like okay 1980 yeah he was yeah. Yeah. so that that's just to have the state of mind to think back and say what could i write about that maybe no one's ever thought of where did you how did you come to that place what made you think of these stories well the, the, so there's there's two answers the first answer is i've always been so i i discovered that fan fiction was a thing when i was writing the first book <laughs> i mean i kind of had some idea that people kind of wrote stuff like this i didn't realize it was as prevalent so i started looking into it and um i was quickly sort of um um I was sort of cold about a lot of fan fiction because all it seems to do so much of it is just rehash what we've already masticated. You know, we, we've, we, we, we know what, I mean, like we, we've already been all around Hogwarts. We've already, we, we've discovered all the secret chambers. We've been in the room of requirement. Um, so, stop, you know, we, you could include that, but stop, you know, it's so much fan fiction just had the same characters doing the same stuff. Um, except with a lot of naughty bits in there too, which, you know, <laughs> I, I have no problem with that. Um, so I was always more interested in exploring the corners we hadn't been to yet. I want to explore. I wanted to explore uh, um, other schools in the Wizarding World. That's why I, I did I created all my Alaron and spent a year there, even though I knew that was probably a big risk and it would probably lose some readers. Um, so I wanted to, to explore different characters. I wanted to um, you know introduce different ghosts and different facets. And so the idea of looking at corners of the Potterverse and Harry's story that I just kind of flew under the radar. We just, we just kind of knew these things happened. Like I wanted to see what, what it was like for Harry when he was a baby. I wanted to see a moment before everything went horrible when life was still beautiful for him and for his family and for the Marauders and their friends. Um, so that's, that's kind of where that came, where that came from. But um, so Tom Gray, who's a friend of mine who lives in Switzerland. Uh, is that right? I believe that's right. He um, asked me to write a story. Uh, this was a, 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 it was a charity thing. People would write fan fiction stories and they would be auctioned off. Somebody would actually own the rights to these fan fiction stories. And so he asked me to be involved with this, this charity, and wanted me to write Christmas themed, a Christmas themed Harry Potter story. Mm -hmm. 
And I just, I couldn't come up with one idea. I came up with three. So I wrote all three of them and then he ended up buying them. Um, I'm sure that's, you know, what was intentional from the beginning, but uh, so it was really cool to be involved with that. And uh, I really enjoyed writing those three stories, all of them exploring a sort of unseen facet of the wizarding world. All right. Well, I know you got to go. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. This is awesome. This was truly my pleasure. It was a lot of fun and we will do it again. Good. Good. I look forward to it. Hope you have a All fabulous right. evening, sir. All right. All right. See Bye. you. <laughs> Bye.